Thanksgiving. When we come back after Thanksgiving, we're going to be starting on 2 Corinthians and find out what, what Paul had to say about grace, one of my favorite topics to preach on uh, in all the Bible, the grace of God. I, I know it's going to be a real blessing to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Take a look at what he says to begin with in verse number 20. He said, he said in verse number 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. And so we see here the beginning of a chapter. I wish I had a month just to stay in chapter 15 because he's talking about the resurrection. I want you to understand that Jesus Christ rose physically, visibly, from, from the dead, from the grave. Uh, I say that because a lot of times liberal Bible commentaries would have you to believe that it was just a historical impossibility. But here we have the possibility, and certainly Paul presents it not only as a fact, but as a witnessed fact. Now, before Paul closes this magnificent book of 1 Corinthians, he devotes this lengthy chapter, chapter 15, to the doctrine of the resurrection. We use this chapter many times when it comes to funeral services. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And so we find here that this is a passage and a topic that so many times preachers only preach from uh, when we talk about the resurrection at a funeral or at Easter time. And we don't, we don't preach about it at other times. But regardless of the time of the year, in which we're studying this particular topic, may I say that this chapter is among the most important chapter in all the Bible concerning the resurrection and why it's important. We don't have a faith. We don't have a salvation. We don't have anything to hang our hat on unless Christ rose from the dead. Let's begin then with the very first part of this chapter and talk about the resurrection gives us faith that is real gives us faith that is real. Now, this is verses 1 through 11. We'll break it down so that we can kind of catch hold of what Paul is talking about. Paul had learned that some of those that were in the church at Corinth denied the resurrection of the dead. Now, they believed in the resurrection of Christ, but they denied that anybody could rise from the dead. Verse number 12 bears that out. When we get there, you'll see what he's talking about. Now, since the resurrection of the dead is guaranteed by Christ's resurrection, Paul is writing at length about the reality of being raised from the dead and about the impact of the resurrection on the Christian life. He starts out by talking about the fact that the resurrection of Christ is scriptural. It is scriptural. Let's read the first four verses. The resurrection of Christ is scriptural. He says in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, <clears throat> by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried and rose again the third day, according to the Scripture. Now, this, these are the necessities of Bible knowledge. If you don't believe what he just said about the virgin birth, about the bodily resurrection, about uh, Christ being the Son of God, all that talked about in those first four verses, then you do not have salvation. You are not, you're not following the proper gospel. These are the important points of what we must believe. So the gospel uh, that Paul had preached to the Corinthians was filled with saving power, verse 1 and 2. It was totally scriptural. It was, the, it was the guarantee of life after this life. And Paul defines it here uh, in these momentous verses. And we look at verse 3 and 4, it announces to us, uh, as I have in blue up on the screen, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and that he was buried, that he rose again the third day, according to the Scripture. In other words, Christ rose from the dead physically, not just spiritually. Some Bible, liberal Bible scholars would say, well, this is just a spiritual resurrection. He came back like a ghost. The Bible says he rose physically. 
uh, within history and not within, this is a historical fact and not just a mythological fact. All of the events surrounding his crucifixion, his resurrection, were completely grounded in the scripture. The Bible taught it. The, the Bible prophets spoke of it. The Bible recorded it. It is completely centered in the word of God. Now take a look at the second part of this, of this point, And that is that the resurrection of Christ is substantiated. Not only is it scriptural, it's substantiated. For this, we want to read verses 5 through 11. He substantiates it. Uh, it's scriptural, and it's been backed up by witnesses. Let's take a look, beginning in verse number 5. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above four, 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained unto this present. But some are fallen asleep, meaning they had already died. After that, he was seen of James, then the other apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether if, if were I or they, so we preach and so we believe. Now, in defense then of the resurrection, Paul brings up a host of witnesses. Not just, you don't want to take my word for it. Let me talk about the people that saw it. He said Cephas, that's Peter, by the way. Peter saw the risen Christ. Then in verse 5, he talked about the 12 also saw him. Later on, more than 500 saw him at the same time. Then James, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus, saw him. And then in verse 7, Paul mentions even the apostles uh, uh, again saw Christ after he rose from the dead. And finally, in verse number 8, Paul tells us that he recounted that he also saw Christ. Now, when did Paul see Christ? On the road to Damascus. He heard him. He saw the light. He saw Christ. And we read about that, by the way, in Acts chapter 9. So how can we have confidence in the reality of Christ's resurrection and, and have hope as a basis of our eternal life? How can we have that hope that, that you can count on? The answer is that we ultimately do so by faith in response to the work of the Holy Spirit who uses the Word of God. Almost invariably, every church I've had, uh, many times our older folks as they get closer to the time when they'll be passing on. One of the questions that they will ask me, I've been in church all my life. I read the Bible. I got saved when I was a kid. Am I really truly saved? I want to make sure before I die, I want to make sure that it's real. Almost even my, some of my family the same way. Because we want to make sure that we have believed the truth and we go through the facts of what the Scripture says and the fact that we're counting on what God has promised we're not counting on our life or our knowledge or our abilities. We're counting on what God said. He said, if you believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. So God's either a bald-faced liar or you believed what, what the Scripture taught, what the Holy Spirit convicted you of. So in that way, the saving grace of the risen Son of God had transformed Paul from a lost, spiritually blind Pharisee uh, to a found and forgiven person who possessed the new life and new ambition. He went off from that. The very next words out of his mouth on the road to Damascus were after saying, Who art thou, Lord? He said, What? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? He was ready to serve the Lord. So from that time on of his conversion to his call to preach, Paul humbly and devotedly proclaimed the good news of Christ's death burial, and resurrection. That's what he says in verses 9, 10, and 11. From the time I got saved, I began to preach about Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. Now let's move on to the second part of this chapter. It has to do with the resurrection. 
And the resurrection gives us a bright hope. A bright hope. Now, nobody can remove the doctrine of the resurrection from the Bible without removing the hope that we have in our human heart. If you remove the resurrection, you remove the hope that you have. Because if Christ did not rise from the dead, then our preaching is in vain and your salvation is in vain. But because Christ rose from the dead, we have hope knowing when we die, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. When we, if we're still alive, when Christ comes back, we will be raised and immediately be in the face of the Lord. Apart from the resurrection, there is no hope. There's no hope of living eternally in heaven uh, or living triumphantly here on this earth. You just don't have the hope. Well, let's look at the emptiness of the occupied tomb. The emptiness of the occupied tomb, verses 12 through 19. He says in verse number 12, he starts out by saying, Now, if Christ be preached, that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain, and your what? Your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up. If so, be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sin. Then He said in verse 18, Then they also which are fallen asleep, those that have died in Christ, are perished. If in, uh, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all most miserable. Folks, listen, the resurrection of Christ makes the believer's resurrection possible. Since Christ rose from the dead, we're going to rise from the dead. The grave is not the end. The end of this life, we're not like a dog we, uh, or like an animal when we die, as, as Solomon talked about. In Ecclesiastes, we just all go down in the grave and, and that's the end. No, the Bible says the resurrection gives us hope of life after this life. More than that, more than the resurrection of Christ makes our resurrection possible, more than that, in God's plan, it makes the believer's resurrection an absolute certainty. And that's what he said in verse 12. Because Christ rose from the dead, your resurrection is for sure. You're not going to be left behind. On the other hand, conversely, Paul argues that if, if we can't look forward to resurrection, then we have to logically look back to the tomb and say, well, the tomb still contains the body of Christ, verse 13. If we don't believe in the resurrection, then the tomb still has to have the body of the Lord Jesus. Here again, the Corinthians showed signs of the lingering influence of their, of their Greek philosophies, about degrading the body. Apparently, some didn't understand that the body uh, will be necessarily uh, fully uh, will necessarily fully enjoy the glorification that we're going to have when Christ raises us from the dead. We're not going to be living in this body anymore. I'm going to wore this one out, and we're going to have a glorified body. It's going to be like Christ's glorious body, and so. To just say, well, he's just going to bring all the dust back together and you're going to have the same old body again. That's, that's no uh, glory at all within itself. So Paul reveals that a dead Christ would force us to regard our preaching as simply a vain exercise and our faith as a groundless superstition. Verse number 14. Furthermore, let me say this. A tomb occupied by Christ's dead body declare that every Christian witness is a liar. It pronounces every Christian still lost in his sin, he says in verse 15 through 17. If Christ didn't raise from the dead, we're just out here lying to the people. And we're still dead in our sin. There's no salvation. The lives of Christian servants would be less than meaningless if the body of Christ is still lying in the tomb. He said that's... He said, that if Christ didn't raise from the dead, if all this is not so, we are of all people most miserable because we don't have anything to look forward to. 
So not only do we see the emptiness of the occupied tomb, we see the fullness of the unoccupied tomb. And we get into these verses. These verses tell us about everything that is ours because Christ rose from the dead. Now, time doesn't permit us to read every verse, but I do want to bring out the highlights of some of the verses in this section. Notice, if you would, verse 20 through 23. He says in verse 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Uh, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Now, Christ's resurrection is considered the first fruits. What does that mean? Three things. First in kind. In other words, he's the first to rise from the dead. First in kind. It means first in priority or position. And then thirdly, it means first of more to come. Because he is the first to rise from the dead in priority, we also will rise from the dead. It's a guarantee that we're going to be able to have a resurrection. So there is a valid gospel to proclaim. When we tell people that Christ died for their sins, and because he died and rose again, they too can be called up and receive their glorified bodies in Christ. So, as death came by Adam, verse 21, so we find that resurrection came by Christ. All right, now the order of the resurrection and other future events appears beginning in verse 23. I want you to take a look from verse 23 through verse 28 and notice the order of things as we read these verses. He said in verse 23, But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they uh, that are Christ at his coming, then cometh the end when he shall uh, have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And he says, the last enemy shall, shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is uh, accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, and put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now what's he talking about? Remember back here, you see the words, at his coming? All of this is talking about when the Lord comes. Now remember, the second coming is in two phases. First of all, the rapture. When the rapture occurs... Uh, the, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. First Thessalonians chapter 4. That's the first part. After the seven-year tribulation, the Lord comes back with His saints. We come back with Him and touch down on the Mount of Olives, followed by the, the Battle of Armageddon and whatnot. But here's something I want you to see. The culmination of these future events is the rule of God. Christ rules during the thousand-year millennial king, kingdom. And then after that, Christ turns over the millennial kingdom to the eternal kingdom of God. So God will rule. Christ will rule. All of this goes throughout all of eternity. We read about that in several verses here. So the resurrection of Christ makes the future eternal, glorious reign of God possible to be able to do these things. Because Christ rose from the dead, He will come back to, to meet us in the air. He will come back with us to reign on this earth. He will place the kingdom before God in the eternal kingdom, uh, eternal kingdom of God for all of eternity because He rose from the dead. You see how important this doctrine is. I want you to take a look. At this next section, the fullness of an unoccupied... I'm going the wrong way. Let me go the right way here first. That way we can all... Verse 31 through 33. Take a look at verse 31. 
He said in verse 31, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have, uh, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. If after the matter of men I have fought with beasts in Ephesus, what advantage, or what advantage is it to me? If the dead rise not, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. But not, uh, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. And so we see what Paul is talking about here. The resurrection of Christ made Paul, his perilous life, worthwhile. He said, I fought with beasts in Ephesus. That's a reference to those that were trying to kill him. You know, they were like wild animals trying to kill him in Ephesus. And he referenced the fighting with them. Verse 33 and 34, Paul called upon the Corinthian believers to turn away from false teachers who denied the resurrection. You see, what they believe about the resurrection would determine how they lived. If they didn't believe in the resurrection, then they lived as if Christ were still dead in the grave. But anticipating questions, he said, how are the dead raised up? Verse 35. Uh, that was the first question that he anticipated. And he drew upon the principles of natural forms. He said, you cast a seed in the ground, it dies, and then it brings forth fruit. Again, he talks about death always precedes life. Next, Paul anticipates the question about what the resurrection body is going to be like. If you read verse 39, he says the new body, he says there's all kinds of life. There's human life, animal life, fish life, bird life. And then he pointed to the astrological life, the bodies that are in the universe. And he noted in verse 40 through 41, he noted everyone had a distinct glory. And since God has created these glorious diversities in the universe, he can be trusted to provide you and me with glorified, resurrected bodies. If he could do that, then why should we doubt that he can give us a glorified body? At the resurrection, a believer's dead body will come out of the grave in a glorified state. I get asked a question of people that are trying to trap me. Oh, what happens if he falls overboard a ship, the shark eats him, and then the shark is eaten and, and on and on it goes. I say, it don't matter what happens to this body. It doesn't matter where it's at. Because when Jesus comes back, he's given me a whole brand new body and putting my soul and my spirit with it. Amen? That's what Paul's teaching here. It, it'll be no longer experience the corruption in which it went into the grave. It will now have incorruption incorruptible it'll be a spiritual body that's fit for eternity it'll be a body i always say this is a this is a uh, uh a body that god gives us to practice with one day he's going to give us the the main thing the eternal body and we'll be able to live throughout all of eternity so in the resurrection each of us will have a spiritual body like christ uh just like he has in the resurrection through glorified, or though glorified, each of us will be exactly, and this is important for you to remember, even though we're glorified, even though we got the glorified body, the Bible teaches that each one of us will be the, exactly the same person that we are right now. We will know even as we are known. I get asked that question quite a bit. Is my husband going to know me when we get to heaven? Is my daddy going to know me when I get to heaven? The reality is we're going to know even, and you're going to know Adam and Eve as well as you know your mama and your daddy and your husband and your children and all the rest. We will know and love each other. We'll all be in the bride of Christ. And so he presented this truth in a new disclosure. He called it, he called it a mystery. Take a look at verse 50 and 51. He said in verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, a mystery is something that's been hidden before, but now is being revealed. That's the rapture. Paul wrote about the rapture of the church. And so he says, I show you a mystery. Verse 51. We shall not all sleep. That means we're not all going to be, uh, we're, we're not all going to die but we shall all be changed. Whether you're dead in the ground or still alive when Christ comes back, 
we all will be changed. The dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain, then shall be called up to meet Him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So instantaneously, instantaneously at Christ's command, the bodies of the dead will rise. I want you to take a look at verse 52 and 53. In verse 52, he says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So in regard to the last trump, let me give you a little bit of Bible geography and customs. The Corinthians would have understood this because when the Roman guard would assemble, they would listen to three trumpet sounds. The first one summoned them to break camp. First trumpet sound, break camp. The second trumpet, fall in line, get ready to march. And the third trumpet, forward march. Those were the three trumpets that every Roman centurion would, would manifest for his troops. Folks, listen. At the rapture, we're going to break camp with this life. We are going to join the resurrected Christians in the, in the heavens. And we're going to depart from this earth to be with Christ in heaven forever and ever. And when the last trump sounds, we're marching out of here. We're marching out of here. Because the resurrection of Christ assures our resurrection, we don't need to be afraid of death. Verse 44 uh, 54 and 55. We don't need to be afraid of dying. We don't need to be afraid when death comes our way. Now I want you to take a look at the very last verse. Because in this chapter he talks about the resurrection gives us a rewarding ministry. Wonderful verse. Wonderful verse. He says in verse 58, it gives us a steadfast per, uh, perseverance. A steadfast perseverance. I want to show you the first part of that verse. Look at what's in blue. He says, Therefore, my beloved, therefore, you always look, see what it's there for. Remember, he's talked about the resurrection. He's talked about the rapture. He's talked about the coming of the Lord. He said, therefore, because Christ rose from the dead, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So he gives us first and foremost, very simply, that we need to persevere because Christ rose from the dead, because He's coming back, because there's life after this, because salvation is guaranteed, because Jesus rose from the dead. We don't have to quit. We don't have to, we don't have to fret. We don't have to give up. The Corinthian believers needed to function as a team. That They were headed to ultimate victory. You see, I know we're not, we're not, fighting the battle. We're the cleanup crew. The battle's already been won. Just read the end of the book. So we see it was time that they put aside their petty differences. Remember all the things that they were just fussing and squabbling about. Put aside your petty differences. Join together in faithful Christian service, he says. They had a big job ahead of them. Look at verse 58. He said, the job required that they be steadfast. That means they had to have a fixed goal. What's the goal of this church? They had to be steadfast. They had to be unmovable. That means unswerving from the faith. They had to always abound in the work of the Lord. That means re remain diligent in the ministry that God has given you to do. The second thing about this verse is we have a sure promise. A sure promise. Not only a steadfast perseverance, but a sure promise. Notice the last part of the verse. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, and neither is yours, neither is mine. Our work is not in vain in the Lord. What a blessing to realize that God has given us the job, and Jesus rose from the dead, and our calling and our salvation is sure. And when we breathe our last breath, we'll inhale celestial air. Take our last step on concrete. Well, our next step will be on golden streets. The next touch we feel will be the hand of the Lord. Folks, listen. All of that is guaranteed 
by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Next week, we'll finish this book with a sermon on giving from your heart. Chapter 16. Shall we stand in prayer?